Glad you're here. I invite you to open your Bibles up to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, that'll be our first passage that we read in just a moment. I want to join in with the announcements that were made. Sure glad that you're here. It's been a dreary day. Most places rainy and cloudy, and, it's, and yet here you are. What a wonderful thing that we can be together here tonight. You've taken, taken advantage of this opportunity. And for those visiting with us from various places, we'll be here through, through Friday night. It might be you can come back and, and be with us again. We would love for you to, to do that very thing. Um, when you're with someone for just a week, as, as Lee even mentioned in his prayer, you, you, you want to you be useful. You want to you be a value. You want to help in ways that, that people may be struggling with. But when you're the stranger... When you're the visitor, you, you don't know what those things are. So what I hope to do this week um, is just mainly look at some things that, that most people do struggle with. Um, there are things in our culture, there are things we live with, there are things we live around that we have to learn to navigate through and that we have to learn to deal with. And so I, I, that's going to be the aim, and I hope tonight will, will be of benefit to you. There are some, there are some lessons you could... If you could go back in a time machine to the 80s, you could preach it, and it would feel up to date. Go back 40 years ago, and you could preach on grace. You could preach on salvation. You could preach on morality, etc. And then there are other lessons. If you went back in a time machine, they wouldn't even know what you were talking about. And one of those lessons is, is, is tonight. What we're going to look at... I don't know what's going on, something, this thing. If it, if it comes on, it comes on. If it doesn't, we'll just walk, we'll work through it. You don't have to, you know, there was a lot of preaching before PowerPoints. Um, and we'll get through it well. I don't know what's going on. This thing is working. So whatever that means to the computer people in here, which is kind of interesting because that's exactly what we're going to talk about. It, there we go. Well, no, no, we don't go. So we're going to talk about internet dangers. We're going to talk about computer issues. How ironic... And just proves the point. We can sing the song right now, can't we? Yeah. The U.S. is totally computerized. 95% um, of homes have some form of it. It's a 21st century lesson. This lesson couldn't be preached 40 years ago because what we're going to talk about didn't even exist to the extent that we're talking about it tonight. Um, it's changed life. And I bet there's people right here, right now saying, I wish, that, I wish that stuff never existed. I wish computers never came about. Well, good for you. Now wake up. Because your name is not Dorothy. And you're not waking up tomorrow and realize that on the other side of the rainbow, this is all a dream. No, this is reality. This is the world we live in. This is the way it is. And we can wish all we want to about how it used to be, but they are here to stay. And this room is full of people with a wide range of familiarity. Some are really, really good. Some just know to do what they know to do. Some know very, very little, but they are a part of our lives. And because they're a part of our lives, we better know how to live with them in a way that put, doesn't put our soul in danger. So let's talk about that tonight. You know, you've got this incredible contrast of ideas. Um, they're good for nothing, some would say. And then some would say, they're the best thing ever. Well, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle like it is with a lot of things. There are some really good that they do. And there are some really evil things that they allow for. So we've got to figure out how to, how to take advantage of one while not falling prey to the other. And while there are dangers to us spiritually, technology is not the problem. Is money the problem? No, money is a blessing when you use it well. But if you allow it to control you, all of a sudden covetousness comes in, and all of a sudden embezzlement comes in, and all of a sudden selfishness comes in, and... Something that is a benefit to us becomes the thing drowning us. Technology is not one bit different. There are blessings to it. We enjoy blessings of it. But it can drown us. It can destroy us spiritually. So we've got to figure out how to be good stewards of it. So, this first of all, 
Let's just look at the idea of, of what are some of the benefits. We'll hurriedly go through that. Just to show uh, the ones who would say, oh, the, there's nothing good about it. Uh, it's good for nothing. No, it's good for a lot. Let's talk about some. Um, the quickness of information. That's a benefit. Some of the young ones in here, you might be surprised to know that your grandparents used to have to stay up till 10 o'clock to find out what the weather was going to be tomorrow. And yes, when you say bless their, bless their soul, yeah, you're right. You don't have to stay up and watch the news. You don't have to wonder for five hours what happened. No, you can find it out in your phone five seconds after it happens. There's this, this mass information right at our hands. And people in here take advantage of that. It's a benefit, isn't it? The idea of, of finding out things about health. Could you imagine what if COVID had hit 40 years ago? 40 years ago, COVID hits and the schools shut down. And there's no such thing as a Zoom. There's no such thing as a FaceTime. There's no, there's no such thing as mass emails where you can send out the assignments. Could you, I don't even know. I was in school in the 80s. I don't even know how it would have been handled. It would have to have been handled through just regular mail, as crazy and as slow as that. But because COVID hit, and what education just kept right on. And you couldn't be in person, but it just kept happening. There's benefits to the quickness of things. There's a benefit, number two, of the enjoyment that it brings. Many of you stay in contact with people you used to not be in very much contact with. Just a quick call. Um, I have a friend who spent, I don't know, three, four, five years or so in, in Australia, preaching in Australia. Had one of his children born in Australia. And his, grand, well, his parents, the child's grandparents, never saw her until she was like four years old. Because they didn't, they, they, they wasn't like they were going to be coming home very often. Never saw her for four years. Today, you're going to see it. There's going to be a FaceTime. You're going to see it 30 minutes after the birth. As soon as they're cleaned up, there's pictures being sent out. There's some enjoyment. And we've all benefited from that. There's, there's the quick connection that we can have. Just a, a real quick text. Hey, I'm thinking about you. Hey, I'm praying about you. I'm praying for you. Just this afternoon, we were gone. Of course, we were with you yesterday. Well, found out this morning when we woke up, one of, our, one of our friends, one of our members at 4th Street had eye surgery this morning. We didn't call and I didn't even know about it. We found out through that mass communication. Something we wouldn't have even known. There's benefits. Bring it into the spiritual side of it. The announcement was made for those at home watching. What if COVID had hit in the 80s? There's people in the black right now. They're not here, and they're not getting anything from it. Websites, sermons online, articles online. The Great Commission was going to the world and teach the gospel. The world is a lot smaller now than it used to be. I have friends who are engaged in Bible studies. Forget about crossing state lines. They're engaged in Bible studies that cross oceans. I'm talking to people that's not even in the United States. There's benefits. I noticed in the foyer, got a bulletin. That bulletin was aided through computer work. Flyers and invitations for this very meeting that you probably have mailed out to people. That flyer was computer aided, computer generated. Um, we have a guy that, one of our two guys, I guess you would say, that kind of um, see over all of our technology things and they, they send mass invitations out. A click of a button, and they've invited 200 people. And I'm guessing you've probably done the same thing. For those who say it's good for nothing, stop it. Because it's just a generality. It's just the statement of somebody who wants to be stubborn. It is good for some things. Just like money is good for some things. And yet money can put us right into hell. There are computer things. There are computer and internet ages that are good for some things. But they can also condemn our souls. 
So we've got to navigate through that. Yes, there are some benefits. Now, what are some dangers? So without, without the, the thing tonight, I'm just going to keep repeating myself. I'm going to work my way through these, uh, these points. I'll keep, as we work from one to the other, I'll just remind us of where we are and how we're, trans, how we're going and progressing from one thought to the rest. You know, Satan, Satan is at work. That's why he takes good things. Sex is a good thing. It's a God-created thing and is designed for heaven. It is for, it, it's designed for man and for wife in this union. But Satan has taken it and he's corrupted it. Money is good. It does good things for us. Satan takes it, controls hearts, and then it corrupts. And here's an example of Satan at work. Look in chapter 5 with me. Look in verse 15. See then... That you walk circumspectly. That word is carefully. The, if I was to ask you if this is a Bible class, I would say, what is the root word of circumspect? You, circumference, right? That's the very same word you get one is where you get the other. Circumference. Think about a circumference. When you were doing geometry and you, circumference. How, how big is the circle? You know what circumspectly means? It means you are aware. You know where you are. You know where the potholes are. You know where the stumbling blocks are. You know where the dangers are. Walk carefully. Walk circumspectly. Pick back up. Verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly. See that you walk carefully. Not as foolish. Not as unwise. But as the wise. Let me paraphrase that. Would it be okay for me to just wrap that up and to say... Take heed to your walk. We talked yesterday. With, take heed to yourself. Pay attention. And now this is, I'm paraphrasing it, but it's the very same message. You be careful where you go. You be careful what you engage in. The topic tonight is no different. We've got to take heed to these things because they are a part of our life. But we can't let them become a part of our life that eats and erodes away our spirituality. So let's look at some dangers that we've got tonight. The first danger we're going to look at is the use of time. It is a time eater. We all have some obligations. We talked about that yesterday. There are family obligations. There are work obligations. And then we, took to the, we looked at the spiritual ramifications of that. Give attention to your reading. Give attention to your ex exhorting and your edifying. Give attention to the teaching. Pay attention to that stuff. And then we talked last night, or maybe it, it may have been yesterday morning, they're blending together on me. Oh, I just don't have the time. Oh, I, I want to read more. I want to pray more. I want to... But I'm just... Woohoo! Wow, I'm so busy. We get on the internet and we go from sight to sight and we do it every day. You get on there and, and something gets your attention and you push it. Check it out. Bam. Check it out. Bam. Check it out. We go from the news page to the sports page to the columnist to the, the obituaries to the, We just bounce around. You know, the interesting thing is, the faster that internet gets, the longer we spend on it. Remember when you had to, you, you had to get online, and you called it up, and you had those little crazy sounds? Um, now, if we have a slow connection, you know what tends to happen? When that thing starts spinning, and you get mad because it won't get you to the site, man, you put the phone up. I'm not waiting on this. The faster it goes the faster we just want to be to the next one. And what happens? And if you tell me you've never experienced it, I'm going to have a hard time believing you. You look at the clock, and you've been there an hour. And you, don't, you haven't moved. Hadn't hardly even been thinking. It's just time is gone. By the time you read this, and by the time you read that, and by the time something got your attention, and you, and you went, it's, it's a time eater. And it kind of numbs us to how much time that we're on it. 
And then we have the gall to say, I don't have time to read Scripture. I don't have time to read a chapter in the book. I don't have time to check on the ones who are sick at home. I don't have time to shoot them even a text. Do we really think that's going to fly at judgment? It's eaten away with even family time. Families don't hardly ever eat together anymore. You know, the, the son's got his phone, and mama's got the iPad, and dad's watching the game on TV, and it, it's just we just kind of eat around one another as opposed to eating with one another. And, and we don't even give it a second thought. Are you still with me in verse 15? Let's read it again, and then we'll keep going. See then that you walk circumspectly, carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. That word redeeming means taking advantage. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Taking advantage of the time. How much time have we blown today? And then we're going to say that we didn't have time to pray. How many websites have we gone to today and then say we haven't had time to give attention to the reading. Oh, and by the way, if there's any here who would say, well, you know, you don't, you know I can go to nap nap time because I don't even have a computer in my house. Oh, yeah, you do. It's probably 52 inches at least and it's hanging on the wall and instead of a mouse, you got a remote control. Take a chill pill. There's a lot of time eaters in our life. And if you're not looking at this kind of screen, you're looking at the other kind of screen. And the applications remain the same. We still have no justification about saying our spiritual responsibilities. It's okay that I've missed out on that because I didn't have the time. No, we do what we want to do. So let's take heed to ourselves. First problem. There's just this incredible use of time. This incredible lack of a proper use of time. Number two. There's, there's just this plethora, this variety of character issues that can become a problem. The first one, think about gossip. You know, what the, you know what Facebook has done? You know what the social medias have done? What they have done is they have made it very, very easy to spread things that are not true. If you were to verbalize something that wasn't true, what would that be? What do you call it? Well, when you send something out, when you see something and then shoot it out to every contact you've got, what's the difference? If you say it and it's not true, you know what that's called, right? When we send something out and it's not true, tell me in the foyer, tell me what the difference is. Be careful what you forward. Some, some of the things that get sent out are unsubstantiated at best. Other things that get sent out are a half-truth at best. Some things that are sent out have some truth to them, but they're exaggerated to the point that you can't even figure out the reality of it anymore. And we just send them out, and we don't think, and we don't think, and we, oh, I like this, and we send it out. We, we see this, and it meets our, uh, our political agenda, or it meets our whatever, and we, and we like it, and we send it out. And if you send it out, it's the same thing as if you said it. And if you said it, it better be true. So before you start sending the stuff out, you better make sure that it's true. You do some research. Because... I hope I'm not busting anybody's bubble when I say this. Just because it's on the internet doesn't make it true. That became a joke for a long time. Bonjour! Just because it's on the internet doesn't make it true. You better check it out before you give it your stamp of approval. Gossip is a problem. Had a long list of uh, Psalm 15. I'm just going to read through them. Proverbs 6, Proverbs 11, Proverbs 26, Romans 1, 1 Timothy 3. Various passages that teach about this very principle. Some people just delight in stirring up the pot. You better make sure what you're sending out is true. Gossip is a problem. 
Second problem of a character nature is the internet allows for a lot of, a lot of pride issues to come up. It has made bragging really, really simple. It's made bragging almost just commonplace. I don't know when this got started. It's almost funny. It probably would be funny if at least to me it wasn't so sad. And <laughs> but people have taken to the internet and Facebook and social media. It's almost as if it's like a journal now. And they'll put out things like, well, you know, slept in a little bit late today. Uh, went to Walmart and picked up a, a bar of soap and a box of crackers. Stopped by Burger King, got me a Walker Jr. for lunch. I'm sorry. But we're not that important, okay? We are not so important that everybody needs to know our little bitty steps. But that's what it's done. It's like we think everybody needs to know everything we've done in a day because that's how elevated we are maybe in our own mind. It allows us not just to brag about ourselves. It allows us to tell others how great they are. And so there's a big generation of young people coming up who think they're the smartest thing walking. Again, don't want to bust bubbles. Your kids and your grandkids are normal. They're going to have an IQ somewhere around 100. They're going to be really good at some things. They're going to pick them up really quick. And they're going to be really bad at other things. And they're not going to be good at all. And they're, they're going to be like you. They're going to do some things really good. And there are some other things they're going to be as lost as a goose about. They need confidence, and we need to develop that in them. But there's a fine line between developing confidence and developing arrogance. And the, and the Internet allows for that. So what's the point? Take heed. Be careful what you send out. Be careful what you flag and, and give a stamp of approval on. Be careful about all the boasting about how great we are and what we have done and how, how, and how nice it was. Be careful. Walk circumspectly. If this doesn't apply to you, it doesn't apply. But if it does, then it does. Gossip is a problem. Pride is a problem. All the potential counselors that are out there. Turn to Proverbs 27. Facebook and other social media aspects, they have changed the very definition of what a friend is. Because a social media friend has become a verb, not even a noun. Oh, will you friend me? Uh, uh, what? If you're, if you're a big part of social media, I'm probably going to be really close on this. You probably have in your contacts friends you don't even know. They were a friend of a friend of a friend who asked you for an invite and you clicked it. There are people we might not even know. And there's millions out there. And they will tell you whatever you want to hear. Look hard enough. Look long enough. And you'll find somebody to tell you your marriage is okay. You'll find somebody to tell you that your decision is okay. You'll find somebody to tell you that... Drinking, smoke, whatever, whatever. They'll tell you it's okay. Now, they won't be giving you any scripture for that. It'll be along the lines of, you, you only live once. And God wants you to be happy. And Look at Proverbs 27. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. There's a lot of enemies on social media who will like to kiss you. They'll tell you what makes you happy. They'll tell you what you want to hear. No, they're the last thing. They're not going to wound you. They're just going to pat you on the back and tell you it's fine. Be careful. Walk circumspectly. Take heed to yourself. Who are your counselors? Who are your advisors? Where are you going when you need some help with a particular issue? There's a lot of people that will tell you a lot of things. Take heed. Walk carefully. Look at Philippians chapter 4. 
Another problem, you've got, you've got gossip, you have pride, you have potential counselors that will tell you anything. Then you've got the idea of just the, 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 the pull to conform. Whether you want to still call that peer pressure, whether you want to call that following the crowd, there's a big crowd on social media. And there's a lot of things that are accepted. And it becomes, once it's accepted, it becomes the norm. And once it becomes the norm, there is this pressure, whether real or, or, or imagined, but there's this pressure to be okay with it, to join in with it. Group can affect how you think. It's called mob mentality. It explains how, about 2,000 years ago, on a particular Sunday, first day of the week, there were palm leaves laid on the ground. And people took their coats off and laid them on the ground. And as a man rode into town on those leaves and on those garments, they started screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, thou son of David. That was Sunday. Roughly five days later or so, same voices, same people were screaming, crucify him, crucify him. That's what mob mentality does. That's what conforming can lead to. We can conform in our language. We can conform in the pictures that we post. It's just mouth dropping some of the pictures you will see Christians put out there. As if it's a secret. It's, it's, there, there's a reason it's called the World Wide Web. And we put that stuff out there. It can affect us by our use of euphemisms. I sure would like to live the rest of my life without having seen a Christian post OMG. But you know, I'm guessing I'm going to be disappointed in that. My guess is it will keep on happening. And we just blasphemously and without even thinking throw God's name out. We've got to consider the things that we post We've got to recognize that those things are on display for everyone. It shows what we like. It shows what we approve of. And what we are doing is, is either building up or destroying. Are you with me in Philippians 4? Have you gotten there yet? What kind of example are we? What kind of edifying and encouraging are we doing? Imagine this. Just think of this as an outline. Before... Before you push send, before you push like, before you send it off, before you post it. Verse 8, finally, my brethren, whatever things are true. Well, you're not going to know if it's true if you don't research it. Be careful about the gossip. Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtuous, if there be any praise, think on these things. Are the things we post, are the things we like, are the things we send off to others, are they true, are they just, are they pure, are they right, are they honorable? Take heed to yourself. Walk circumspectly concerning these things. And there's a thousand other, but which, those are some character issues. So point one, it's a time eater of time eaters. Maybe one of the biggest time eaters in our lives. It can, if we let it, it can lead to some character issues. It can lead to some character flaws. We have to get control of that. The third thing it can do at least infidelity. It can. I need to say that, but it doesn't, but it can. And five, six, ten years ago, maybe it was some out there thing. Now, after all the years that these things have existed, you probably know someone is affected. If you don't know someone is affected, you know someone who knows someone. You can probably put a name to the scenario. Here's this man and woman, and they meet through a meet online, begin to talk, begin to talk pretty often, begin to talk longer, 
And all of a sudden, the conversations kind of take a shift. You know, my, my husband, you know, he just doesn't, doesn't really notice me anymore. You know, my wife, she just doesn't really seem to appreciate what I do. And you know, I just, I, you're the only person who understands me. You're the only person I can let my hair down with. And all of a sudden, there's this give and take. And there's this seduction that's going on. There's this... Um, in time, it leads to, at best, an improper relationship. At worst, full-blown affair. But whether it's acted on or not, if you're married in here, you better understand there are boundaries that have to be maintained. Could you imagine... As a married person, could you imagine meeting someone in some restaurant here on the mountain? You meet some of the opposite sex and you go off in the corner and, and you just stay there for a couple of hours just talking intimately to one another across from the table. Would you do that? You'll sit on your couch with your phone and do the same thing. What's the difference? The heart's impacted the same. The mind is impacted the same. The relationship that you made a vow for life, that's impacted the same. And we think because it's done secretly. No, it's, 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 it's in the secret part of the messaging. It's in the chat room. It's not open publicly. Stop it. It's justifi justifications at best. God knows. And there have been families who have been destroyed because of this. There have been... Marriages destroyed because of this. There has been trust destroyed because of this. And you know it's true. This is not hypothetical stuff. And you know that. I want to read you an article. I'm not going to read the article. I want to read the opening paragraph of an article I thought was pretty good. It's called Infidelity in the Inbox. That's a pretty, pretty catchy name, isn't it? Infidelity in the, in the Inbox. When temptation is at your fingertips. With the prevalence of email, chat rooms, and other online technology, a married person today can engage in a completely private and intimate relationship with someone other than his or her spouse, all within their home. And in the hot house of secrecy, seduction can flourish unabated. And then it goes on. This is not made up stuff. Money's a good thing until it corrupts us. And technology is a good thing until it corrupts us. And it can corrupt us because of the time that we prioritize for it. It can corrupt us because of the character flaws that it can lead us to start acting out. It can corrupt us because of what it does to the marriage vow it can corrupt us, number four, because of pornography. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And I realize, again, when you're, when you're just here for a week, you want to do quick hitters. You want to touch as much as you can, as quick as you can. These things probably should have their own lesson. I'm sure that they have been done and will be done again one day. Today, we're just shotgun blasting it. to try to get, us, get our attention, to wake us up, to make us renew a taking of heed. Pornography maybe the biggest internet business that's out there. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, and I didn't misspeak that. I didn't miss the M. B, multi-billion. There are over 10 million sites. It has more incoming money. You go check it out. It has more incoming money per year than ABC, NBC, and CBS combined. And now it has made pornography, which has always been a plague, it's now made it easy. It's now made it private. It affects men. It affects women. It affects kids. And you'd be shocked at how quickly it can affect the mom and daddy. You better wake up. In Ephesians 5, there's these various phrases that would speak to this. Look in verse 3. Fornication. The old King James says that all uncleanness. No, that doesn't mean you got dirt under your fingernails. Doesn't mean you're working on an engine and you got some grease on your hand. This is talking about impurities of the heart. 
fornication, impurity, covetousness. Have you ever thought that in the realm of pornography? You're looking at someone that doesn't belong to you. You're wanting something that you have no right to. Do you, um, for those that are married in this room, go back to Genesis 2, go back to Genesis 3. Do you know how many women, Eve, uh, or excuse me, how many women that, uh, that, that Adam had to pick from? One. You know how many men Eve had to pick from? One. If you are married in this room, do you know how many women you have? One. If you're married in this woman, in this room and you're a woman, do you know how many men you have to pick from? One. We're no different than them. We're in our own miniature garden. There is one woman for you. There is one man for you. And coveting another is right here. Fornication, impurity, covetousness. Let it not once be named among you as becoming saints. It's, it, it, it's not proper. Don't let it be named, it says. Look in verse 4. Neither filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, which are not convenient. They're not fitting. Ever try something on and you're oh, that's a little tight. It doesn't fit. All these, all, these, all these sins, the majority of them speaking of a sexual nature, they don't fit. They're not becoming, verse 3, they're not becoming in the life of a saint. They don't fit. They have no place in our heart. We'll talk about the heart in just a moment. And without beating around the bush, the percentages say... Somebody in this room is struggling with this right now. It's not hypothetical stuff. This is not, this is not Looney Tunes. And this is not Howdy Doody. The numbers and percentages say somebody in this room is struggling with this right now. Take heed to yourself. Walk circumspectly. What are you going to do about it? Let me give you one more, fifth one. So there is... There's the time. There's the character issues. There's the infidelity possibility. There is the pornography possibility. There is the gambling possibility. It has made Las Vegas and Atlantic City unnecessary anymore. They're just tourist attractions now. You can gamble on anything you want to from the living room. Again, you're talking about another multi-million dollar industry. You're talking about an action that reflects greed. You're talking about an action that practices the opposite of the golden rule you're trying to take. You are, you're talking about an action that impacts stewardship and how we are handling the things God has blessed us with and expects us to use properly. You're talking about an action that has addictive natures. You know why there's a Gamblers Anonymous? Because it's addictive. And it's real. Now here's the catch. To all of this. I've got to flip it just a second. These are real issues. Every last one of them. None of this has been made up stuff. This is real and you know it's real. And yet people use the computer every day. And they don't fall prey to any of this. And neither do we. We can... God has blessed us with money and we can use it in a way that doesn't corrupt us. God has blessed us with all these benefits, both spiritually and... Uh, again, there's people watching right now because of the technology. There's benefits to it. We can enjoy one without crossing over into the others. They're all avoidable. The benefits can be enjoyed while the evil is avoided. And if you're not aware of these parents, you need to get some filters. It'll prevent your children from happening upon a website that could corrupt their thinking. It'll block the porn sites. It'll block the gambling sites. And anything that's even close to them. Wake up and whatever it costs you, you can't afford not to do it. Take advantage of, again, what somebody has come up with to allow the benefits without the evil. Look in Proverbs chapter 4. 
See, what if we filter ourselves? What if we filter our heart? Proverbs chapter 4. Well, the heart is the issue in all of these things. All those character flaws. If the heart is right, those things aren't going to be an issue. The infidelity, if the heart is right, that's not going to be an issue. Pornography, if the heart's right, it'll be controlled. It'll be fought. It just won't be, it just won't control. Look in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That idea behind issues of life, it means that's the starting point. This is where it begins, is, what the, is, is, is the wisdom of the proverb here. Guard your heart, that's where it starts. That, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it's saying. Guard your heart, because that's the starting point for everything else. Okay, what's everything else? I'm glad you asked. Look in verse 24. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. How are you going to do that? It starts in the heart. Put away from you perverse lips. How are you going to do that? You control the heart. You control the mouth. Control the heart. You control the tongue. Verse 25. Let your eyes look right ahead and let your eyelids look straight before you. How do you control what you put your eyes on? You control the heart. You control the eyes. Verse 26. Make level the path of your feet that your ways might be established. How do you, con how do you get to control where you go? Control the heart. You control the feet. Verse 27, do not turn your right hand to the or do not turn to the right hand or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Just look through verse 24. Mouth, lips, keep going. Eyes, feet, hand. What controls all that stuff? The heart does. Verse 23 was exactly right. The heart's the starting point. All those other things, they're going to fall in line. If the heart's corrupt, the hand's going to do corrupt things. If the heart's corrupt, the eyes are going to look at, 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 at corrupt things. If the heart is corrupt, the feet's going to go to corrupt places. Control the heart, and you control the actions. Let me give you one more verse, one more verse on that. Look in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I guess you would say a New Testament slant on that very same passage. This would be the Cliff's Notes of... That passage. Half a sentence. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Sanctify the Lord in your hearts. That's how simple. He takes the Proverbs, and that's where it puts it. Sanctify the Lord's in your heart. You know, we have probably, for many of you, 1 Peter 3, 15 is a memory verse. Be ready to give an answer. When someone asks you of the hope that's within you, be ready to give an answer. We've memorized the other part, the second half. But here's the first phrase. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. We memorized the last part, and we kind of did the flyover on this one. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. That is the issues of life. That's the starting point. And when we do that, these other things, we can, with time and effort and fighting and repenting and... We can get control of that. All of us have done some of these things. And we've been ashamed of it. We can't let them become just continual patterns. Take heed. Walk circumspectly. Walk carefully. And recommit ourselves to taking advantage of these opportunities. We want to be better going forward. Get your song books out. I mentioned if you went back 40 years ago to the 80s, nobody would know what in the world this was about. Do you think 40 years in the future, it's going to be any different? In 2050-something, they're going to, or what, what, no, 2060-something, they're going to look back to the 2020s and say, wow, bless those people's hearts. Yeah. Technology's just going to keep on growing. It's going to keep on expanding. I don't pay attention enough to know what the coming things are. Some of you probably already do. But it will just keep changing. It'll keep advancing. Aren't we thankful we serve a God who doesn't change? He doesn't change the rule book. He doesn't change the requirements. 
He doesn't change on the whim because of a bad hair day what He wants. No, He is consistent. And He has told us what He wants. There's a lot of people who will tell you a lot of things. There's a lot of counselors out there. And then there's wisdom from above. Let us take it. Let us heed it. And let's be careful about our character. Let's be careful about what we let these advancements that we get pleasure from and benefit from. Don't let them be the thing that condemns us. We have visitors here tonight. So I said this yesterday, I'll say it again. I don't know who is who. I don't know who is a Christian, who is not. But if you know who Jesus is, you need to act on that. Don't let that knowledge of faith go to waste. Confess your sins. If you believe He died for your sins, why would you not repent of them? If you believe baptism washes away sins, then why in the world are you holding on to the pew? Do something. And do it tonight. You've waited long enough. For those of us that are Christians, it's just something tonight hit. Something tonight hit. Whatever hit, don't get mad about it. Just change. Just be soft and, and determine going forward, I'm going to be better. And if we get better and you get better, we get better together. If we can do anything tonight to help you in a public way, if we can pray for you or assist you, we want to do it. We want to do it while you stand and sing.